Hello, National Public students. First chapter. We're going to get straight into it, have a really good time. Today, we're going to be talking a little bit about why do we even bother to study the national public sector? It's fun. I promise it's fun. It's actually going to be really enjoyable. So let's just jump straight on into it. Uh, let me share the screen. Screen two. All righty. Oh, maybe put my head at the bottom. Fancy. Fancy like that. I promise I'll be faster at this the further we go through the semester. So why do we study the national public sector? Uh, because the rules that are designed there, the taxes that are designed there, the expenditure programs that are designed there, to go into every single part of your life. Uh, from the regulations on the little aglets on your sneakers to how much of your money is taken and taxes to fund the Carnegie Library to everything else. Why do these things exist? Why do they happen? Let's understand them. Let's build the tools to really understand when they're doing good, when they're doing harm, when there's unintended consequences, when there's unintended benefits. And that's one of the purposes of this course is being able to understand those sorts of things. So let's, 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 just, let's just jump right into it. I know, it's just so excited. So there's four main questions of public finance. I think if you took my local class, this set of slides and the next set of slides might seem a little familiar, but they are going to change drastically since we're now thinking about the national sphere. But essentially, public sector is just kind of understanding the financial questions and the role of government within the economy. All right, so when should the government intervene? How might the government intervene? All right, so is this a problem that requires government intervention? If it is one that requires government intervention, how do we do it? All right, do we have a tax? Do we start a program? Do we start two programs? Do we just hand people cash and expect them to know what to do with it? How might we intervene? What is the effects of these interventions? So is that going to end out really well? Is it gonna end out bad? Are there some people that's helping more than other people? And why do some governments choose to intervene in the way that they do? So let's go through each one of these. First is the when question. When, when, when should government intervene, right? So economics generally presumes that markets deliver efficient outcomes. I mean, I would like to think that, right? We got our supply and our demand, and we're gonna meet at the equilibrium in the middle, and life is beautiful and wonderful. And you know, sometimes, most of the time, actually, most of the time that's true, that markets can deliver an efficient outcome. But sometimes, there are market failures and why the government intervention exists in the first place is to try to correct for some market failures that might not have been otherwise addressed so what is a market failure okay we're going to go through a lot of terminology in this and the next class because then they'll give us a little bit of a basis for how we're going to start these discussions within this course i i don't try to bring in politics. I don't try to bring in anything else. At the end of the day, what we're doing is we are learning the language of public economics, how to discuss public economics, and how to analyze the benefits and the cost of multiple different types of programs. Okay, it's just what we're doing. And market failures are just problems that cause the market economy to deliver an outcome that does not maximize efficiency. It might technically maximize happiness for people to just like throw all of their waste and trash into the river. Sure, cool, might maximize happiness now, but there might be long-term environmental damage. There might be some sort of other market failure that happens where there's this massive pollution issue that maybe affects the people that are down the river. Those are, that's, that's a market failure that maybe needs some help if they're unable to fix the problem themselves, right? There's also the idea of kind of the health insurance market right? So health insurance across the entire world is very, very different. Uh, when deciding to get a flu shot, what do you do? You're not necessarily considering, ah, oh, well, if I get a flu shot, 12 people around me will not get the flu if I get the flu. No, at the end of the day, you're saying, ah, oh, this lessens my chance of getting the flu. But in, in your internal calculation, you may not be thinking like, ah, oh, this lessens my chance to get the flu and saves 12 other people. That may not be part of the steps and motions that you're going through, right? So when those don't necessarily correspond, that's kind of the idea of a market failure. Let's, let's, stay, on, let's stay on like 
shots, right? So we have like the flu shot. Let's think about the measles vaccine. So the measles vaccine was introduced in 1963. Before then, you might see a lot of older people that have like pop marks and stuff from when they had measles um, during either their childhood or adult life. It, it could actually be very debilitating. It could actually stay dormant in your body for years and years to come. So they ended up making a vaccine for this in the 1960s. And by the time we got to the 1980s, measles was almost unheard of. It was just like, who gets measles? Because we have vaccines for that. But then time went on a little bit. And in between 1989 and 1991, the United States had this huge outbreak in measles. All of a sudden, this disease that they thought was gone just was like back right? It ended up that this outbreak was kind of tied to low immunization rates during to disadvantage inner city use. In major cities, there were very low socioeconomic status neighborhoods where there were a lot of disadvantaged children that didn't have the health care necessary to even get the measles vaccine. So the measles spread like wildfire through these neighborhoods. And it ended up that having these children who may not have had the vaccine, so they were un, unimmunized, um, they imposed negative externalities on others because they were more likely to get sick. And if they got sick, they were more likely to get everyone else around them sick. So this, this is obviously an issue, right? There's something that just wasn't quite making sense there. Why did this thing that we thought we had eradicated, it all of a sudden came back, what do we do about that? Well, so the federal government at that point stepped in because maybe this was one of those win situations of, oh, okay, we don't want a bunch of people to die. Maybe, maybe we need a little bit of help right now, just, just a little bit, right? And the federal government encouraged parents to immunize their children. How they did this was they helped pay for vaccines for these low-income families that couldn't necessarily afford it. When they did that, it drastically reduced measles rates. Overnight, it was back like measles didn't exist. Now, was this necessarily beneficial? Was this what government should have done at the time? It's not really for me to say. That's kind of what we're supposed to figure out in this class. You're supposed to find out the evidence and look at the evidence and look at the results and come up with your own rationale for what things happen. So that's kind of like an example of the when, but how about the how, right? So there's two main different ways that we can kind of instigate a payment for something. We can tax or subsidize a private sale. If we want people to do less of something, we tax it, right? In the United States, they want people to smoke less cigarettes. There's a reason there's a huge tax on cigarettes. Makes it so less people smoke cigarettes because now they're more expensive. If we want more people to do something, we subsidize it. We would like more farmers to produce potatoes, but potatoes don't really make a lot of money. So we instead subsidize by giving them an extra payment if they, if they produce potatoes. So then growing potatoes is more financially beneficial to them. So they might do that. Subsidizing is when we, there's something that's underproduced and we want more of it. Taxes is when there's something that's overproduced and we want less of it. So these are two things in our toolkit that we can use to be able to manipulate the quantity and prices of different things. We have lots of other options too. It's not just all taxes and subsidies. That's not the only tools in our arsenal, right? We can restrict or mandate private sales, our purchases, our public provisions. So should the government just provide something? Maybe there's public financing. Maybe there, there's a vaccine that they're trying to work on and it's half funded through research and development from the government and the other half through private. There's so many different things. There's so many different ways of how these sort of interventions can happen. Some of them are more beneficial than others. So we have the when, we have the how, let's talk about the what. Interventions have direct and indirect effects. Now, this is another form of language that I'm gonna be using a lot in this class. So some things are direct effects. Um, I don't know. If I pick up this tomato timer, there's the direct effect of I have a tomato in my hand. There's also the indirect effect that I am unable to pick up other things. Let me give you a better example. because Maybe that's not the best example ever. Direct effects, they're the effects of government intervention that would be predicted if an individual did not change their behavior. So let's say we have 49 million uninsured people in the United States. Let's say that we all of a sudden overnight have universal health insurance. 
Well, what would we predict? We'd predict that these 49 people or 49 million people that didn't have health insurance, they would now have health insurance. Okay, that is a direct effect. No one had to change their behavior. It's just that this was provided. Now there's indirect effects. Indirect effects are the effects of government intervention that arise only because individuals change their behavior. So we have 49 million people uninsured. Those people will be covered if universal health insurance happens. Well, um, let's say that there are some people that say, oh, wow, hold on, they're getting free health insurance? Psh, I'm gonna like get rid of my plan that I'm paying hundreds and hundreds of dollars for. Who needs that? I'm done. Okay, I want the free one. And then all of a sudden you have people changing. You have people who get rid of their private insurance because they know that they can get the free insurance. That's an indirect effect. All these people who end up dropping their private insurance and instead switching to the free universal coverage, that's an indirect effect because these are people who had to change their behavior in response to this environment. Isn't that cool? That's just kind of cool. Uh, let me give you an example. The Congressional Budget Office. Uh, we'll, we'll actually be talking about them a lot. They're a pretty interesting office. So they score policy proposals. For example, let's say that I want to bring in a grant because I want to. I don't know, start a new statistics lab on campus. Well, then that would have to go through. I'd have to give it as a policy. I'd have to give the budget. I'd have to give some budget implications, talk about who all I could help, who all probably wouldn't be helped, and things like that. And the CBO would score this policy proposal, and they put it in a pile with all the other policy proposals that have been scored. And that's kind of the toolkit they use to decide which policy should be gone for first, right? So they do this using theoretical tools. So thinking, okay, um, what would happen to supply? What would happen to demand? What's happening in these situations? And empirical tools. So they say, ah, here's all of our data points of what we think would happen. Let's draw like a line through it using statistics. And then we're going to try to figure out if the policy changes, what happens to the slope of that line? It's kind of neat. It's kind of cool. So they do that. And this can determine the fate of legislation. It could be the coolest piece of legislation that you think could ever exist, but if the CBO says, wow, this is gonna really harm people and it's a bad idea, it's gonna kill a piece of legislation really quickly. So the methods and results derived from empirical economics are central to the development of public policy. You may not think about it, but there's a reason why the city of Edwardsville has a great economic developer. There's a reason why St. Louis does. There's a reason why the state of Illinois does. There's a reason why the United States does and Canada does and North Korea does and Russia does. They have economists at all levels. And that's because that's how we figure out what's really going to happen from policy, right? So we have public policy people out there in the world. They love writing and policy. We have lawyers out there in the world. They love writing policy. You wanna know what the economists do? The economists come in and we see that policy and we figure out what's actually going to happen from that policy. Is there gonna be good stuff? Is there gonna be bad stuff? Are we accidentally gonna harm a bunch of people? We're gonna know. That's what public economists do. Eh, I like it. This is what I do for a living. I really enjoy this. So we have the when, we have the how, we have the what, and let's do the why, the last one, right? So, governments do not always choose the efficient or socially desirable outcome. So it might be that there's a market failure that's not at the efficient level, and then governments still might not want to be at the efficient level. They might choose something completely different. Governments face enormous challenges in figuring out what the public wants, uh, because we have voting systems, and we have marketing campaigns, and we have like different sort of ways to call people using the American Community Survey. We have the census, but figuring out what every American wants is very difficult. Then choosing among the policies on how to make people happy is also very, very difficult, which is why we have the study of economics called political economy. Political economy is kind of the theory of how the political process produces decisions. We're going to be talking about this a lot in this class because it's something that us as public economists kind of deal with. We have to think about the theory of, of the process. We have to see, okay, we have a bunch of disadvantaged single parent households. We really want to help in this low income neighborhood. We have the ability to raise taxes or the ability to put in a new toll road, or the ability to have some sort of public health and safety campaign. And we can do one of those three. We would come in, we'd look at those three and figure out, okay, using the theory of the political process, how much this is actually going to be able to get through, if we're going to be able to do this, uh, what, what the intended consequences are, which ones are going to help this group 
without damaging other groups. Political economy. So why the national public sector? Some of you have taken my local and state class where we learn about what's happening in the city of Edwardsville or other cities or what's happening at the state level. How do they make their decisions? But the national public sector is actually really important because it's huge, right? Uh, the national government over the years has taken more and more control over what happens to tax dollars, how they get divvied, and how finances happen at all levels of government. Knowing what happens at the national level and how exactly things work at the national level is crucial to being able to understand every single point of the economy and how the economy relates to the economies of all other countries, right? Government spending represents a large sector of the economy, probably one of the largest sectors especially in the U.S., but also around the world. The spending is financed with taxes and debt, so they can either tax the people here, or they can take debt from other countries, or they can just print money. Um, these all have different effects. All three of those things do different things, and we need to know what they do, right? Because most sectors of the economy are directly affected by legislation. Are, are different sort of regulations. There's regulations that say, I don't know, uh, these are like heartburn gummies, exactly what can be in here right? Or, I don't know, radios. There's a lot of regulations on what can be on the radio, what, what signals can come through the radio, who has a right to what signal. There's just factors, regulation in every sector of the economy, and we need to know kind of how they work together. So let's look at federal spending. Federal spending in the 1930s wasn't very much. This was kind of before or about the time we had put in our first income taxes at the federal level. But they, they didn't spend a lot of money. Some of it went to national defense, some of it went to school, some of it went to a couple other things like research and development, and it started creeping up. And as a percentage of GDP, federal spending just got greater and greater and greater. And then World War II happened. And with World War II, we saw this giant spike in government spending. That was like, you know, those, those old pictures that you see where it's like, yeah, throw your bumper onto the pile because we're collecting metal for the troops. And then and they were, you know, contracting out different parachute making and blimp making and things like that to almost every American company and, and some that were not American companies. So there was a lot of federal spending through World War II and came back down, but it's still been trending slightly upwards ever since. Uh, this one ends at 2017, but 2020 also has a giant spike associated with it that we're going to be seeing in future, future iterations for a long time to come, but those textbooks just haven't been written yet. So after this, we need to think about the centralization or decentralization of the process. Centralization is just kind of the extent to which spending is concentrated, right? So it used to be that it was pretty decentralized. A lot of spending happened at the local level and at the state level and at the national level, but they kind of made their own decisions. More and more over the past like three to four decades, a lot of this has shifted to now a lot of the money is raised by the national government, it's collected by the national government, and then the national government says, ah, you state over there, we give you two billion, and, and then you should give part of that two billion to that little town over there. It's kind of more of a centralized decision than the decentralized economy that we've always kind of relied on in the United States. And thinking about this degree of centrality and how it changes over time allows us to know the key features of government and how they interrelate with one another. So, at the end of the day, government budgets are just like households, right? Me and my household, I think, okay, all right, I'm getting so much money in this month and I have to pay rent and water and cable and, and a car payment and a bunch of other things and I have like this list. So I have the money in and I have the money out and I have to budget for that. Government has to do the same thing. If revenue exceeds spending, we have a surplus. If revenue falls short of spending, so we end up spending a ton of money that we don't really have, we have a deficit. I'm sure you've heard about the deficit because unlike states, states have to have a balanced budget. At the end of the day, their money in has to equal their money out. National government doesn't have to do that. National government can just keep spending even when there's no money there to spend. Then they can borrow or then they can tax more or then they can do other things, right? So the national government is not held to the restriction of having to have a balanced budget, which means debt 
can go out of control very, very quickly. So we need to think about what happens in those situations. Uh, so let's look at the federal surplus deficit. This is the yearly um, additional amount of money that we have in surplus. So some, some years we had a good year where we spent, or we spent less than we made. Most years we end up spending more than we make through taxes or other means, right? Which means that we end up just having this level of debt that gets greater and greater and greater over time. Ah, that's, that's a little scary to think about because that means that there's massive amounts of deficit. Now, how do we distribute this sort of spending? How, how do we kind of think about that? Well, first, we kind of got to think, what do we spend money on? Okay, well, public goods. We're gonna go through that next class where we break down exactly what a public good is, but for right now, just kind of think of things that like the government provides. So parks, um, lighthouses, national defense, uh, CDC research, you know, there's things that the government ends up providing where anybody can benefit from these sorts of things. Like, because we have a military, everybody in the United States is slightly safer or a lot safer. So because of these relationships, th these are more public goods. So, okay, we spend money on that. The next thing we spend money on is social insurance programs. So this is health insurance, this is social security, this is, this is a whole bunch of other things because there's government provision of insurance markets against adverse effects. In case everyone goes broke tomorrow and the stock market plummets, we, we have social security so that old people can still pay bills and eat, right? Uh, we have subsidized insurance so that people who can't afford insurance don't get gravely injured and that costs a lot of money for both them and the state. If we just have some sort of insurance system ahead of time, it ends up saving money, right? Over time, spending has shifted drastically more towards the social insurance, especially health insurance, because this is something that's been debated for the past decade or so, especially with when Obama came in and he put in the ACA and then they've been tearing apart pieces of the ACA and the new pieces have come in that are slightly different. But healthcare has been something that we have been fighting about all over for a while and it's very hotly debated and, and it's something that we have to think about in spending so we have this distribution of spending oops so what does that actually look like well back in the 1960s about half of all the money that the national government spent was was on the military and national defense and creating those sorts of things. I mean, that kind of makes sense because this is right around the time where we ended up having like the Cold War where we were all trying to like race to space and a lot of that was funded through different sort of national defense spendings for NASA. Uh, then we have interest, social security, unemployment, education, health, and these sorts of things, right? Well, this is a completely different slice of pie than what we had in 2016, you know, just a few years ago, where instead a third almost is being spent on health care alone. Then after that is social security and then national defense. We spend more than any other country in the world on national defense and it's still only 14% of the national uh, GDP spending, right? Uh, they, which means there's a lot being spent on social security and a lot being spent on health. So these are things that we need to understand with our distributions of the federal spending. So that's how we spend the money, but how do we make the money, right? We have to think about the idea of revenue. So, okay, so how does government make money? A lot of it's through taxes. So the first is the individual income tax. Everybody who has a job in the United States ends up paying the individual income tax, which is just a tax levied on the income of U.S. residents. It's some proportion of your income, and we're going to talk about average tax rates and marginal tax rates and things like that later on. Oh no, I have the hiccups. Of course, first video and I get the hiccups. All right, so then we have corporate tax revenues. So individual income taxes are for people. Corporate tax revenues, these are monies taken from the taxable incomes of businesses in the United States. Then there's payroll taxes. So every time that you, you pay your taxes, you're probably gonna see something at the bottom and it says FICA and a bunch of money gone. And then you're like, who the heck is FICA? Well, 
that actually stands for a lot of these payroll taxes. So you think that you pay all your payroll tax, but you don't. You have that amount of money taken out of your paycheck, and then your employer matches that same amount that's put together and sent to the government. And that's how we end up paying for things like Social Security uh, for, for elderly individuals. So the major shift over time at the federal level has been the rapid shrinking of corporate taxes. So Corporations are paying less and less taxes in the United States. And because of this decrease in revenue from them, that has to be increased in other places, right? So the income taxes for individuals are going up and payroll taxes are going up to kind of offset a little bit of this imbalance. So let's look at how, how we kind of just make money, right? So in the 1960s, about half came from income taxes. We can see today, Oh, well, back in 2016, it's a very similar percentage that we're seeing in between the two for the percent that, that's brought by income taxes. What we notice that's different is back in 1960, notice how much of this triangle was corporate taxes and then social insurance and then excise taxes. They, they were all fairly evenly distributed. But then in 2016, we see that the second largest chunk of the circle is actually just social insurance. This is the money that comes in from payroll taxes. Uh, it is just, it's, it's come in or it's grown over time. So government kind of has this regulatory role. The, and this is for the purpose of trying to deal with what they believe is market failures. Why do the aglets on your sneakers need to be regulated by the government? Because they think that you might fall and trip and bump your head if they are not regulated by the government, right? So the government regulates a wide variety of economic and social activities. I'm gonna talk about just a couple of like the main ones at the federal level. So first we got like the Food and Drug Administration. This is the people that come in and they look at food, cosmetic drugs, medical devices, and they determine if they're safe or not. And this process can take a while. Okay, then the second one is OSHA. You've probably heard of this one, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. This one looks at workplace safety. If you have an issue in your workplace, you feel it is unsafe, you call OSHA, they send someone out and then they find your employer. Next one would be the Federal Communication Commission. That's back to the idea that like um, radios, there's certain stations, right? There's only so many and some people are entitled to them and they're not too close together or else they would overlap. This all happens because the Federal Communications Commission controls radio, TV, wire, satellite, cable, and internet in some ways. Though I think some of that also goes through the FTC. Anyways, uh, the Environmental Protection Agency, this is the one that deals with pollution of air and water and figuring out things with wildlife and protecting endangered species. So government really has a regulatory role. They provide rules and structure to attempt to correct for market failures. So let's, let's go back through our, you know, how, when, why, what, with kind of a different when. Let's think about the, the Affordable Care Act. So the Affordable Care Act was by far the most hotly debated aspect of, of just the early Obama elections. I remember being in high school and like people wouldn't stop talking about this. I think this is when I started like paying attention to government just because everybody was angry when, when the in initial Affordable Care Act stuff started to come through and people started thinking about it. So people keep debating the fundamental question of should government be playing a more prominent role? Should they be providing universal health care or should they scale back the role and instead just allow for kind of a cheap market system to figure out itself and adjust its own prices for each individual and let them get to their own happy equilibrium? Well, it comes down to the idea of do you believe that that happy equilibrium could be designed on its own? So supporters of the ACA argue that the market, that there were market failures making government involvement imperative. They said, you know, private insurance is not gonna figure it out on its own, we gotta do this. Then opponents argued that the intervention dries up premiums and that an unregulated market would best serve the needs. So you're saying, no, no, we don't need to do that. If we just let the market do what it wants, like they'll give affordable plans to people that need affordable plans. They'll give expensive plans to people that can have expensive plans. The market's gonna figure it out on its own. We don't need to do this. So these supporters and opponents hotly debated this item. So what happened? What's kind of the how of this government intervention eventually went in? So the question of how to intervene was a major topic in the debates. 
over the Republican efforts to repeal the ACA in 2017. So I think, what was this? When Trump first came in and he wanted to get rid of the ACA and then he was gonna call it like Trump healthcare or something. Um, the Republicans argued that government should reduce regulations and they were like, hey, um, you know how we're losing a lot of money through the paperwork people have to do because like they have to jump through a lot of hurdles for this. Let's reduce down the regulations and we're gonna stop providing insurance through government programs and we're just going to allow people to purchase things on their own. And we're gonna have a less regulated market. We're gonna let people do about as many rules. Then, then the Democrats on the other side strongly resisted this. And they were like, um, no. Uh, and they suggested that the reductions in the generosity of public insurance would, would cause limitations and that some people would not be able to afford the plans that the Republicans thought would exist but the Democrats didn't think would exist. So their disagreement was kind of in the fundamental part of should government intervene and is the government intervention even necessary to begin with? And that's kind of what they were debating during this. So what ended up happening? Well, the CBO estimated that the passage of the ACA would not significantly lower the, the growth of healthcare costs. So um, if, if it got rid or if they got rid of it, it wouldn't necessarily save people money. They also reported that reducing it could cause 30 million people to lose health insurance. So the problem is it's hard to actually evaluate the effects, right? Because we have the 30 million people that would lose insurance, but we don't know how many of those people would go get private insurance. So we don't actually know what, what the total effect would be. We know one partial effect. So us, as public economists, come in and we say, oh, wow, that's kind of cool. All right, so what are the unintended consequences? Let's try to figure it out. Let's try to figure out how many people would change their behavior. What, what are the indirect effects? And then let's figure out what the direct effects would be. And then, and then we kind of figure out the system from there or what the effects of this would have been. So why? That's the last one of the questions, right? We had the who, the what, the when, uh, but what about the why? Well, health policy experts expected every state to choose or expand their Medicaid program under the ACA. Uh, because Medicaid is something that's kind of provided by the state level, even though it's kind of financed through the national level. We're going to talk all about that. We have a whole, whole week on it, right? Oh, also, if you're really interested, we offer a health econ class. Um, health econ's not my thing. I'm a public economist, but Marlon Tracy and Ari Bellison, they're, they're great. They're fantastic. They're both health economists. If you want to talk about the ACA, go talk to them. They will talk to you all day. But health policy experts expected every state to expand these programs uh, since most costs would be borne by other states, right? Because it was kind of, okay, we're going to expand, but with the ACA, every state's paying into it. So since every state's paying into it, I'm not the only one paying into it. But about half the states didn't initially do this because there was just a lot of political fights and this was something that they could take a position on. So they were like, no, no, um, we're not going to expand because no. And, and it just became political turmoil as opposed to actually looking at what the policy interventions would be. So why did I even give you that long-winded story? Uh, that's because I want you to kind of understand why the national public sector matters. Why do they need economists, right? Because government doesn't always make good decisions. And lack of government isn't always making the best decisions. And that's because sometimes they need a person to come in and we look at the cost, we look at the benefits, we look at the intended consequences and the unintended consequences. We look at the direct effects and the indirect effects and kind of analyze this entire sphere. And from there, we can make policy recommendations. From there, we can help write legislation. From there, we can make the world a better place for people. And that's the whole reason why I do econ at the end of the day. I don't know why you do it, but that's why I do it is because I wanna make the world a better place, you know? One, one good or bad policy at a time. So government ends up paying a central role in the lives of individuals. They do, they do, right? And there's ongoing disagreements that are going to persist for years to come about whether this role should be expanded, stay the same, or contract. And really there's no good answer because there's arguments for all of it. What we do at the end of the day is we put away our feelings because we are economists and we put, we put away our feelings and we look at the data and we say, okay, what are the logical outcomes? And let's figure this out, let's do the math, let's figure out all the different case scenarios and then be able to present those. I think that's kind of fun. So these examples set an example for many of the public finance issues we're going to explore over the semester. This semester, we're gonna talk about so many national policy things from 
protest, to vaccines, to the ACA, to education spending, to differences in national defense and security. We're going to be talking about a wide variety of big public finance issues. And I hope you're as excited about the journey as I am. On that, I'm going to let you go. Um, have a great one.